um, please give a warm applause to Tobias Fiebig, who will be talking about IP version 6 global scanning. Thank you. So, good evening, everybody. Um, nice that you still made it, even though it's uh, 11 p.m. Um, of course, this is not uh, work of me alone. It is joint work with colleagues from UC Santa Barbara, um, Kevin Bogolte, Shuang Hao, Christoph Krugel, and Giovanni Wigna. Um, first thing about me, um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Science, and um, somewhat noticed that wetware is not really my life. Um, so I actually went on to get a master's in system network engineering, and uh, since I got that, I'm more or less desperately trying to get a PhD from uh, Professor Feldman and Professor Seifert at TU Berlin. Um, my research interests can be summarized as uh, basically what nobody else does, but not because my stuff is ingenious, but because most people say, well, that's stupid, that won't work anyway. Um, and I think we all know this as uh, misconfiguration. So. Um, you all know these nice people that are running database servers on the internet without authentication. Uh, I have heard of a big ISP that actually managed to run their provisioning system on the internet, which was not that good for connectivity for their customers. Um, there's also other nice examples. So Mitfahrgelegenheiten.de was actually pretty good in doing backups. Um, they even encrypted them and stored the AES key with it. Um, and, and there's always the fun of finding an iSCSI device um, that belongs to some bulletproof hoster read-write on the internet. Um, and something I had to learn, there is something called remote DMA. Uh, what could be better than doing DMA over the internet? <laughs> so um, basically, whatever I will tell you today um, is directed at finding these. Um, but first things first. Um, ethics. Um, I, I, I may tell you about a nice tool to have a lot of fun with, but basically... What are you, stoned or stupid? You don't hack a bank across state lines from your house. You get nailed by the FBI. Where are your brains? In your ass? Follow this good advice. Um, think about this event. Think about the amount of bandwidth you have. Think about the amount of bandwidth other people have. Um, think about them having um, this nice time between uh, the holidays at the end of the year where they don't want to work, um, which might happen if suddenly DNS servers start crashing uh, and other services become unreliable. So, um, back to my motivation and some um, view of related work. Um, the, the first part will be a little bit dry. Um, so if you start to get bored, um, there's a special slide where I ask the person next to you to wake you up, um, just right before the fun stu uh, stuff starts. So please don't run away. So in the beginning, uh, there was ZMAP. That was like three years ago. Um, and it, it started this whole thing about we can scan the whole IPv4 internet. We, we, we can do like internet-wide security evaluations. Um, and that was actually a whole, whole lot of fun. So um, I think two years ago, there was this nice service in one of the lecture halls at this event um, where, where you would have something like chat roulette, only with VNC service. <laughs> yes, um, you laugh, but it actually brings us to the second point. It stops being funny when you find some um, asset construction facility in India on one of these slides. Um, ZMAP was heavily used to scan for heartbleed and to do analysis on how heartbleed was mitigated. Um, ZMAP was used to scan for, um, well, at least open TCP ports where you could then do a um, key exchange to see how is key sharing between HTTPS servers in the wild. Um, there was research on amplification attack servers, well, basically the amplifiers for the amplification attacks. And this ability to exhaustively scan actually helps the security community a lot. But, as with all good things, or rather not so good things in this case, um, IPv4 is coming to an end. Um, there's only also many addresses, 2 to the power of 32, in fact, theoretically. 
Um, and there, there's a lot of work investigating how this is getting more and more exhausted, and by now getting an IPv4 address is actually pretty hard. So um, what happened is that people introduced IPv6, like 20 years ago, around about, I think even more. Um, with IPv6, there comes a lot more addresses, like 2 to the power of 128, theoretically. Um, and we, we can actually see that IPv6 is starting to get adapted. So the graph I have here is um, actually a bandwidth graph from this event. And we see that at peak points, we, uh, at peak points, we saw around 25% of outbound IPv6 traffic. Um, th this is a little bit skewed because as soon as you deploy IPv6 to your user network, you will suddenly see a lot of traffic to like two or three big players like uh, Google with YouTube and Facebook. But it still demonstrates that IPv6 is a thing that's coming. Um, however, if we start to use, for example, ZMAP on IPv6, we will suddenly have to wait. I, I cannot really pronounce that number, but it's really, really huge. And I, I, I don't really intend on living that long. So um, let's come to related work. So um, looking at IPv4 addresses was an interesting tool. It was not only used in the security community, um, but especially there, and it helped a lot there. Um, so people want to have the same thing for IPv6. Um, current work is relatively um, focused on starting or trying to observe IPv6 address usage in the wild. Not doing active scans, but having some vantage point where they sit, where they can read something, which provides some information about used IPv6 addresses. So Foromsky, Plonka, and Berger, um, they are using the access logs of a large CDN. Of course, as good scientists, they don't disclose uh, which CDN this is, but one of them has an Akamai mailing address. Um, Xux et al., who are mostly the uh, vantage point freest of them all, um, they are using various DNS data sources, but not the same as I will present in this talk. And then there's Grasse et al., um, they do have, for some reason, access to a large European IXP and can look on flow data there and thereby can get information about utilized IPv6 addresses in the wild. So let's quickly go over these. So um, Foremsky, Plonker, and Berger actually provided nice work um, where they used their data sources to train a tool, which could then predict another active, that means replying to ICMP, IPv6 address, based on the data sets they had observed previously. Um, they are mostly using the uh, CDN data. They, they have a small, really, really tiny portion of data that was um, gathered as the data I will present on, uh, and they utilize trace route data. Um, this has certain drawbacks. For example, the CDN logs, of course, do not really represent a lot of, well, servers, um, especially not servers in the wide internet out there. Um, trace route data is, by nature, really really, really biased towards networking devices because, well, it's trace route data. Um, the work by Grasse et al. in principle is somewhat similar. So they also try to predict active IPv6 addresses based on the data sets they have. So then we have Sys et al. Uh, Sys et al. are actually um, doing various um, minings on DNS data sets. So they have um, recursor data sets. So they actually get logs from DNS recursors. Um, but they are also doing uh, something really fun where they would actually do a PTR lookup for every address in the IPv4 space. And then it do an uh, quad A lookup to get the IPv6 address for that FQDN. Um, and, and their work is actually one of the big motivations for what I'll be presenting today, um, be because they figured out that IPv6 security is not really doing that well. Um, in other words, it's doing terribly. Um, but, well. So, in uh, summary, um, I looked in my basement, I didn't find a CDN. 
uh, I looked it off further and I didn't find an IXP. And when I asked my IXP if, um, uh, ISP if they wanted to let me um, read their um, recursive access logs, they also said something including no. <sighs> well, um, but on the other hand, so w if I was a politician, I would now be like, but we have this IoT, this Internet of Things, this, we really need this scanning to protect all the people. So, um, well, we came up with methodology. Um, by the way, um, this is the point where you want to wake up people next to you that didn't really care about related work. So, um, first things first. So, um, there's another person I'd like to credit. Uh, it's uh, Peter van Dijk. Um, I'm not really sure if I can do the IJ thing correctly because I'm not Dutch. Um, but I hope I, um, well, I tried. Anyway, I met him at last ITF in Berlin. Um, and as I, well, heard he's Dutch, um, I believed him when he started to talk about DNS. Um, and he said, if I want to get a lot of IPv6 addresses that are assigned to servers, not clients, I should actually look at, well, IPv6 reverse DNS. He said he had some like interesting preview result thingies, and I should start to dig into that. So, well, as I said, Dutch people know about DNS, like most of the DNS servers we're currently using come from the Netherlands. Let's try it. So, um, let's start with a uh, short recap. So, um, IPv6 address, as I said, 128 bits, and you can represent it in 32 so-called nibbles. Um, those are the little things representing hexadecimal characters we see here. Um, and reverse DNS is a way to get for an IP um, address you have an FQDN, a fully qualified domain name. Um, you do this by um, doing some transformation to the IPv6 address. So um, you first reverse it. Um, and then you put basically points between each of the nibbles for different levels in the PTR tree. Uh, and as top level domain and second level domain, you have ip6.arper. Um, and under that tree, um, you then find um, a record. And that record you can do a PTR request to, and then you get a FQDN from the DNS server. So the next thing that is somewhat important at this point is how DNS works. So um, RFC 1034, I hope I get this right. Um, I see somebody in the audience that will probably beat me up if I don't. Um, it's not really clear about it, but, but tries to mean it, so it got clarified in RFC 8020, um, the meaning of NX domain. Um, Technically, NX domain should mean if you receive the reply NX domain from a server um, for a point in a tree, um, like the one to the right, um, that there is nothing at that point you requested or anywhere there under. Um, so what, what, what this technology basically is, is um, descending trees um, where we received a no error for the root node. Uh, we can actually try this. So we, 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 we have our given root here, which is ip6.arper, and we do a DNS query for 0.ip6.arper. We get an NX domain. So we don't descend in that tree. We do the same for the 1, we do the same for the 2, 3, 4, up to the E, and we always get an NX domain. If we know, well, we don't have to descend that tree. But when we have the F, we do get a no error. We don't get any data back, but we get no error. So, well, we descend that tree. Let's try. Oop. Um, I never managed to clear out class. Sorry. Um, anyway, we do the same thing again, and this time we start with a zero, uh, and, and we immediately get a no data uh, or no error. So we can descend that tree already. Oop. Um, and do the same thing again, and then we descend that tree, and by doing this 32 times, so and then. IPv6 address, there are 32 nibbles, um, we can finally arrive at utilized IPv6 addresses. Um, and you see, if we start with a zero, this is basically a depth-first search 
in this huge DNS tree that is spanned out by um, the reverse DNS name system. So um, as I said, this is in itself not new. Um, you have RFC um, 7707, which actually um, discusses this as a possible technique for network reconnaissance in smaller networks. And they uh, actually reference um, this Peter van Dijk, who uh, recommended this technique to me. Um, and he actually uh, wrote a small blog article about this like three, four years ago, um, and provided a Python implementation which you can utilize to actually scan the network, or rather, DNS PDR prefix. Um, this was also the starting ground for the tooling, uh, which will be provided to you in the end of this talk. First, um, what, what I used to conduct these scans is, um, well, it's basically the compute server we have for um, doing machine learning at the research group. Uh, my colleagues were not so happy that they had to stop doing this while I did my scans. Um, but as I produced something called academic code, which is basically like startup code, but we don't call it production ready. Um, <laughs> everybody who loved works in a startup. Um, but, but I'm pretty sure that somebody who is actually better with code than me, so like a programmer who can actually write production code, um, will also be able to run this code, well, the code they write themselves uh, on their laptop. So um, the first thing w w when I thought about this technique was um, that, that, that I do a depth first search, which is a pretty bad thing if the first part of the tree is on a really, really slow DNS server on the other side of the world. Um, so, so you want to have the opportunity to do some kind of breadth first search to parallelize over different um, DNS servers. Um, for this, I basically just iterate in four nibble steps. So in a first step, I will iterate um, up to a length of um, four nibbles for all possible um, FQDN rec, oh well, PDI entries. Um, then I will collect all of these, and for each of these, uh, do the enumeration step for another four nibbles. Um, Based on flavor, um, on personal tastes, one might also opt to go from 16 nibbles to 32 directly, so from 64-bit to 128-bit, which may have advantages, may have disadvantages, uh, but we will see that later when we look at the data. So um, this was basically what I built directly after IETF. I um, hacked this together, um, went to the office, ran it, um, was pretty happy because after I let it run for a week, I found uh, 70 million records. So um, I then looked into the data and uh, was wondering why I got this funny email from a large ISP uh, with them complaining about a lot of traffic from my machine to theirs. Um, and I learned about a really nice feature you want to have in your reverse zones when you're offering reverse zones or rather networks to customers and end users, which is uh, dynamic reverse zones. So um, I have an example here. So w when you have a big network and um, you don't want to manually set all those two to the power of 64 uh, reverse entries for all the possible users you could have, um, you just set a script in your DNS server that actually generates a reverse FQDN um, for any given, um, well, reverse pointer record. Um, they also may be static, um, and I also found funny, dynamically generated looking domains that are probably DNS tunnels or something like that. At least they were always returning 32 bits of something random. Point being, in this case, you will never find an NX domain. So um, w when your algorithm is just plainly stupidly going in there, it will find a lot of records, but they all belong to, well, however big this um, reverse, uh, this dynamically generated reverse zone is. Um, so um, I, I thought about a heuristics. Um, and I first thought about doing something computational linguistics enhanced stuff where I would compare returned um, reverse, uh, well, returned FQDNs to figure out if they may or may not be actually somewhat related. Turns out 
doesn't really work, doesn't really perform. Uh, what performs for better is um, just, just trying to query a um, static set of records. Um, and if at least three of these exist, assume the domain or rather the um, subtree is dynamically generated. Um, so at least three records is a personal preference. Um, the picking of um, filling up the tree to a length of 32 nibbles with zeros, ones, twos, threes, up until f uh, is a not so personal reference. Um, some people recommended to me to do this with um, random data, but then you actually have to have enough non-blocking entropy for that. So, well, taste question, but um, this actually works. So um, using this, I actually tried this again. So I started at ip6.upper, um, let it enumerate, and then I found 1.6 million records. And you have to say, I started off with like 70 million. I was like really amazed. And now I only have 1.6 million records. Um, so I was somewhat confused. Which brought me to another nice finding. So there are DNS servers that are for some reason not RFC 8020 compliant. So they may actually send an X domain instead of no error. Um, we have an example here, so if um, the DNS server on which f.ip6.upper um, is resident on um, sends an NX domain because it has no explicit record at that point, well, then I will not see 0.f.ip6.upper. Um, and to actually counter this issue, I got the idea of seeding my algorithm. So I do not start at ip6.upper, but I start at various well-known predetermined to exist, well, subtrees of the DNS tree for ip6.upper. <laughs> um, I, I built a somewhat funny algorithm for that, where um, at each step, so at each um, nibble length, remember the slide, a couple slides back, um, so for four nibbles, I would actually crop um, the seed um, record to a length of four nibbles and re-add the full record length again of the seed record, just so that I get at each iteration um, all the information possible from my seed records. Um, the seed sources I used were the route views project and the ripe NCC, um, um, how's it called? Something with BGP view, I always forget. Anyway, um, these are publicly available um, and actually are documented in the scripts that will be published with this talk. Um, other possible sources are, of course, um, the algorithm um, this at all used, where they would actually do the quad A lookups for the returned FQDNs of IPv4 reverse um, pointers and basically whatever data set you can get your hands on. Um, so if you can, for example, if you are at a big event where a lot of people are using remote IPv6 servers and you were actually able to read the network traffic, which I recommend not to do, then you could also use that as a source for seeding. So uh, with, with the seed set, I actually ran the programs again. Uh, this time it took uh, nearly three days, uh, running a parallel with 80 threads, and I found 5.3 million records, which is sounding really small, but um, due to the, well, state of IPv6, uh, deployment practices in IPv6, this is pr still pretty decent. So um, it, it doesn't show a full, full, full picture, but it shows a large subset. But um, I was not really satisfied with the speed of this, so I tried to parallelize more um, because I realized that my um, server was, well, not really that busy. Uh, I tried to run it with 400 threads. It ran faster, found less. Um, and the lesson I had to learn was that basically um, the one IP address I used for resolving ran out of sockets. So if you want to heavily parallelize this, um, do, do, it, do it on multiple machines with more addresses to actually use for outbound DNS queries. Um, other thing that falls into this um, is um, if, if you are running this yourself, um, have a local resolver. Uh, because latency to your local resolver, for example, in this network, the resolver output 
offered by network operations um, will extremely um, increase the length of these scans and it possibly will overload them. So don't run it against your speed port. So um, this is basically the start of the case studies. Um, first look into this. Um, you see basically plotted here the amount of queries I needed for records um, in slash 64s. Um, and, and we basically see a nice distribution uh, between uh, extremely structured zones, so zones that have um, colon, colon, one, colon, colon, two, extremely structured, and those that have nearly random addresses or possibly uh, UI 64 addresses. Um, to the left are basically those where I need um, more queries to find less records. And then here are the structured ones, which due to the depth first nature of the algorithm will also be found first, that are then found with less queries. But I promised more fun parts. Um, you can also utilize this tool to look at something specific. So um, from the huge data set you collect, you, you can single out specific networks. Um, and, and this, for example, is um, an overview of how a software as a service provider um, does their network assignment policy. So, so how IPv6 addresses and networks are assigned with that service provider. Um, Figuring out which service provider this is is uh, left as an exercise to the reader. Um, and I was told that this is too academic and just boring. Um, so I looked at something else, which is a little bit more fun. So I personally do not really do a lot of stock trading, but if you look at um, IPv6 networks, people suddenly have a whole lot of addresses to use. So they will address everything. They will address loopback addresses with public addresses. They will address IPMI with public addresses. Everything. So if you look at such a network, in this case, starting here in uh, September, uh, with, with 65K of hosts around about, you, you suddenly see a huge jump, jump of around 10K in just a matter of, well, two weeks. Um, and like two months later, you can realize um, that this SAAS provider actually announces a record sales quarter. So this is one of the opportunities where you could use this tooling for, actually gathering information on company growth. But which is probably a lot more fun is looking at topologies. So for me, this was the most fun thing I could do with this, apart from security scans, where we all know what they will turn up. So first thing I did was looking at an IXP. Um, by the way, I'd like to mention that um, this all is my personal opinion and I'm not representing affiliations and so forth. So um, I rendered graphs, gray are hosts, blue are slash 64s, red are slash 48s, and green are slash 32s. And uh, if you zoom out a little, you can also see black ones. Black ones are hosts that are for some reason connected to two slash 64s or more. So, after importing this, this actually looks more like a block cube than anything fun. However, as it's a basically directed graph, uh, one can sort this, um, make it float apart a little so you can actually recognize parts of the structure. Um, you can add funny labels to it. And then you can look at what you can see. So um, this is a network of a huge IXP. Um, this is, for example, um, their pop in Hamburg, and basically their peering network. Um, of course, they also have a dependence in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, and nice thing you can actually see is, um, so our black friend over there, um, there you can actually see um, the networks the customers are having uh, behind the router um, 
behind the peering net in Frankfurt. Um, they also have this famous black holing infrastructure, which you can see, being um, connected to their provisioning um, and some internal uh, routing or interconnect infrastructure. And um, Firewall 6 appears to be their central firewall in uh, Frankfurt, um, with a whole lot of um, hosts connected to it, for example, an um, Elasticsearch system for uh, customer accounting um, and processing flow data. Um, but I think nerds are somewhat more into um, other networks. So this is an example of nasa.gov. Um, but, but there's also somewhat bigger topologies one might want to look at. Um, is everybody familiar with .mil? <laughs> so, um, li little side note, I'm also doing um, the monitoring for network operations. And we will now look into it. At the moment, the only network. Um, I have the feeling that I know the topology of better than the network at this conference. Um, for reasons, um, it, it will remain anonymous for the purpose of this talk. But um, technically, the data sets are public. So. Let's have a huge journey to, uh, through a network. Um, so, like all good networks, it has a border router um, and some uh, portal systems, some um, administration interfaces, um, and possibly user access networks. Um, they also run like network infrastructure, for example, um, hosts called Big Brother, um, which, is, which is actually an ancient monitoring system. I want to give them that. Um, which they actually had to have a lot of service for, but um, they are currently apparently migrating to Prometheus, which is a somewhat newer monitoring system. <laughs> Um, let, let's look at their infrastructure, how do they run. So um, they run a lot of open source software, so we see Gentoo. <laughs> um, Kerberos, um, probably not so who. And they also have a puppet production host. Um, well. Um, they also have an Admiral Akbar, which, which made me think. <laughs> which made me think that it might be a honeypot. But what worried me most is actually this one. Um, on a little more serious note, um, what this also teaches us is that these networks are run by nerds. So, um, some more fun things due to uh, popular demand, technical IoT. Um, the redactions happened due to, um, well, for, for some reasons it is not opportune to uh, expose the IP fridges and military installations when you have collaborators from the United States. Um, another nice thing we actually found in our data set is uh, TCP 666, the number of the backplane 666, in this case, is a placeholder. Um, because for reasons I actually talked to the CSERT of that company before this talk and they were like, hmm, nice, yeah, we, we, we kind of know about this. And I was like, cool, nice, so, so I can talk about it. And they were like, yeah, well, with us. <laughs> so um, when, when we are scanning some of the IPv6 addresses we collected, we would find um, this TCP port being open uh, on hosts that um, would also expose talent SSH and BGP and somewhat look like backbone links. 
Um, funnily enough, um, the TCP port, which should be on the slides, um, was more related to a technology you usually don't find on a backbone router. Um, after some communication with a couple of friends, uh, we figured out that technically this port should be bound to local host on the systems. <laughs> um, as it is used for some backplane services. Um, funny side note, um, the vendor didn't even know how the customers managed to get this exposed. <laughs> so then we have DHCP v6. Um, we all know the issues of, um, well, devices that suddenly get um, IPv6 addresses and become then reachable. My most favorites were printers. Um, and something you see a lot is that these devices that are then exposed and that are really vulnerable um, actually do have um, a forward pointer for the FQDN that is returned uh, for the v6 address that points to an RFC 1918, so a private network address. Um, other things you find is uh, IPMI, um, so out-of-bound management in various forms, um, what, what you basically use when everything burns down. Um, one really nice, nice large operator actually um, has all their IPMI interfaces reachable with ICMP version 6, uh, which, which made me wonder what would happen, which I, of course, didn't do, but well, it's... It's something I'm wondering about, because, well, you don't really want your IPMI on the internet. And um, also something for the people a little bit more into um, network infrastructure, uh, b besides our exposed backplanes, um, besides our exposed backplanes, um, you will also find a lot of uh, RIP out there, a lot of BGP, um, and talent as such of internet infrastructure and internet backbone services. Um, another fun thing to find is Docker. Um, um, one part is the nice things you can deploy with Docker, for example, Elasticsearch. Um, it's really amazing who runs Elasticsearch um, as a service without authentication, only reachable via uh, IPv6 but reachable with IPv6. Um, for Docker instances, um, I don't know if, if, if you do know what these TCP ports mean for Docker installation. Um, this is actually an API you, you, for which you have to protect. There's information in the documentation, how you can enable authentication. There's actually good blog posts on how you can enable authentication um, using certificates and an um, Nginx um, reverse proxy but you can also just expose it to the internet. Um, <clears throat> well. Um, so this is just a set of the opportunities you can have, um, which you shouldn't have. Um, so um, besides actually doing the right thing and doing firewalling for your, your IPv6 network, you could also do something, well, security by obscurity. Um, you, you could try to configure your um, reverse DNS zones in a way that always returns a no data or no error. Um, basically, masking them um, to this. It feels hard to say that this is an attack, but basically to this. Um, this was already available in 2012 when uh, Van Dijk first played with this. Um, there's tools available, not applicable to all DNS servers out there, um, but the concept should be clear, so it should be implementable. On the other hand, we should think about um, techniques that probably are applicable, even though this specific technique I just presented is not available. So let's quickly conclude. Um, in the end, you can... Uh, Try to reject packets, but you cannot hide your network topology. Um, you should think before setting um, PTR records, um, and you should think before connecting things to the internet. Um, you can download my tool chain um, from the GitLab instance of my um, research group. And there is an academic publication coming up in uh, March 2017, uh, which is also dealing with this, this technique on a more measurement-related point of view. Um, Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that there are.
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, first question, as usually, goes to the Sigma Angel. Did you actually think about trying DNS zone transfer to see if the server would give up a bunch of PTR records due to misconfiguration? Um, using other techniques like AXFR is uh, discussed in the research publication, but we didn't actually try it. Um, well, there's a Git link. Next question goes to the microphone number five. Uh, yeah, yeah, you got me lost. Oh, sorry. Uh, you got me lost a little bit here when you said that, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you should run your own local DNS resolver uh, to get faster I don't know what. And I'm kind of wondering, did you use some kind of uh, asynchronous I.O. Um, in order like, to, to parallel your resolutions? instead of using a local resolver, or maybe I misunderstood what this was solving. Okay, um, so, so running a local resolver on the machine you're doing the measurements on um, is basically um, solving the issue of overloading um, the local resolver for your research institution, having your system administrator standing in your office, being really, really angry. Um, you, you know, all these things that happen when they suddenly have to deal with a DNS recursor that is doing mostly the queries you are doing and not those of other people in the room. Or research institute. I see. So it's not improving the speed. Um, it actually helps a little with speed because um, either you do the resolving yourself, or you put it somewhere else, um, and, and you basically have to wait for the answers. So if you have a little bit of latency um, towards your recursor, um, the whole process will pile up, take longer. If it's on your local machine, you basically reduce one one small part of latency. But again, you can probably do this better when you do the recursing and resolving from the tool chain, which I didn't do because I'm not a good programmer. Okay, thank you. Next question goes to Mark for number one. Okay, so did you actually consider that there might be a few servers hidden in the, uh, those subnets who have these uh, generated PTR records? Um, yes, there may be servers hidden in there, but uh, due to the dynamically generated PTR records, I cannot verify this without exhaustively enumerating the whole, well, the whole tree, um, which just gets really, really large. Okay, so you just, uh, I, I, there's like the... the I don't know and I cannot know. All right, thank you. Okay, next question goes to now, microphone number two. Hi, um, from experience I found that uh, IPv6 reverse lookups are more sparse than uh, the IPv4 versions. So do you have a reference on how many you, uh, hosts you find with that technique versus hosts? that are there without reverse lookup? Um, I would, would really love to have that. Um, I also, um, so basically if you want to make the statement you, you just basically asked for, um, you would have to compare um, this data set um, with another independent data set uh, which, which looks at another an, uh, angle of IPv6. For example, um, large IXP, um, for example, um, CDN data set, CDN data set will be biased um, for clients and servers, so most probably the IXP data set. Um, at the moment, I didn't have availability of those, so I didn't investigate that. Okay, microphone number six. You mentioned uh, that results or the data set of your work are public, so where is the data set? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, um, it, it's actually stored in a distributed manner on a lot of DNS servers. <laughs> and um, it, as you know it from all cool platforms, um, that there's a dedicated download client you have to utilize. Um, download client source code is available at that GitHub lo uh, GitLab location. Okay, microphone number five. Uh, hello. Uh, so, quick question. Uh, most of the data on the slides were sort of Western uh, and the dot mail exploration and so on. So, uh, just as a general question, did you explore the IPv6? Oh, sorry. <laughs> did you explore a lot of this on the Asian networks of, so say, Korea, China, which has massive IPv6 use? 
uh, mm. because of the latency thing, you know. Uh, Actually, I didn't uh, really focus on a specific per continent analysis. Um, I mostly um, presented so far in the academic work the technique in itself, um, and I picked interesting case studies um, that, that would demonstrate the um, potential of the technique. Um, but what you suggest is actually an interesting point for further work. Uh, I would, uh, for anyone interested in that, uh, I would recommend Hong Kong as to the start seeing point uh, to do the scans. Cheers. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. So